hit me. So, Michael, this film is an absolutely brilliant film. So what was your first reaction when you sat down and read the script? What made you want to be part of this film? Thank you so much for your words, Dave. Um, so it's actually an interesting story. I, uh, a couple uh, buddies of mine I used to write music with, I had a little record uh, deal back in uh, early 2000 when, when MySpace Records was around. And, and uh, I used to write music with these two brothers, the Gear Brothers. They're the writers of the script. And some time had passed since we had spoken, and I reconnected with them, and they said, hey, you know, I said, what have you guys been up to? And they're like, Michael, we've been, uh, we've been writing uh, screenplays. And I was like, these guys were always so brilliant, and our tastes were so aligned that I immediately said to them, send me all the screenplays. And the retaliators just, it was actually the first one I read of theirs, and it just popped off the page for me. You know, I really... Um, I understood it. It, it. it connected with me. I, I thought like the, if you will, Spielbergian sort of Dante Gremlinsy esque beginning into the Tarantino esque without using the master's name uh, lightly, of course. But yep. the third act, it blows up into that amazing third act, and and again, and the wink at the '80s and all those great movies of the '80s and '90s. The, your character finds themselves in such a unique position. How do you, as an actor, prepare yourself for something? And I don't think this is spoiling anything by talking about it, but um, losing a child, that is such a... It's something that I can't imagine. Um, how do you, as an actor, put yourself in that place to, to know what that is like? Yeah, you know, first, I think um, I, I, I do have a, 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 a five-year-old son, so I think that's really helpful, but, you know, um, because you don't, until you're a parent, I think you, you, you know, you can understand that as an actor, and you have to do a lot of, um, uh, you know, imaginary work and, and, and sort of as-ifs, if you would, but there's nothing like when you do have a kid and that connection is just so strong, and um, gosh, just the, the, the thought of anything happening to them. Um, you know, again, this film is about the, the, the revenge fantasy, you know, and, and it allows a viewer to take that fantasy on a little walk. And um, I think that I, I did a lot of research um, in terms of the character that I was playing. But to get back to that revenge, I was also um, I was watching this uh, this show like a, 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 a law show like a. Uh, a reality show and I saw a fellow who was who who's, was standing across in the courtroom from his convicted uh, daughter's killer and he looked sort of like a math teacher he wasn't an intimidating fellow at all skinny guy and he actually grabbed like a pencil or something and jumped over the booth to get the guy in that moment when he had that second to do something that's how angry and how driven he was for revenge and of course the you know the the courtroom the police grabbed him but that was something that really affected me yeah um, and i used some of that as well when you say that you did some research for for this role what kind of things were you researching because to me this is a a very very unique role that you play here yeah, thank you. So what I did was I went to a sort of modern day, I play a modern day pastor, and I went to a few sermons um, that involved music and, you know, uh, younger men of the cloth and sort of how they conduct themselves in that atmosphere and how those modern day sermons are held. But I think at the end of the day, look, whether you're a man of the cloth or whoever we are as men and women, we're human beings. And we want to be loved, and um, and we love, and you know. I think that's the essence of this story. So, in terms of the parts of the film where I'm doing a sermon and I'm preaching, and to understand that uh, quality of having bands at your sermons and stuff like that, I I, I did that research. But again, the um, the work of and, you know, this guy's basically, he's a really good guy. He's really, uh, he's a rock star in his community to people. He's a helpful yeah. person. And I was also on a television show called Rescue Me about New York City firefighters yep. for a long time on the <laughs> FX network. 
And, you know, some of my character for that actually came back to me. It's very different character, but I think at the beginning it lends itself to him. You know, uh, he was a very sweet guy. So you find those qualities, you know, within other characters you've played and you when you bring the, those qualities of yourself to the surface. But then, of course, in this story, man, it takes a 360 turn, doesn't it? Yep, it does. And this film takes you to some pretty dark places. How, as an actor, do you prepare yourself for that? And how do you turn off at the end of a day on a set when your character's been in so many intense scenes? How do you then turn that off to to go back and go to sleep for the night and things like that? Yeah, I mean, in this, it really does go to a lot of dark places, this movie. And that's one of the things that drew me in, too, actually. I just found it so interesting because it does change so much. There are a lot of, a lot of uh, you know, light moments in the beginning, and then it gets really, really crazy, like you said. Um, you know... <clears throat> I lived with this character actually for a while, David, because we were filming during COVID. So interestingly enough, we had to do, uh, we shot over the course of two years um, on and off. And it was really hard because I spent so much time with him and, you know, and, and the story and this, this tale of retaliation and revenge. And um, I think it, it wasn't always easy to turn off um but I will tell you that the chaos of filming during COVID and having your crew, I also produced on this movie, so having your crew be in fear, all that sort of helped play into the character in different moments because you use what you have, you know, at the time. So I think that all helped. I will tell you, you asked about uh, what was really crazy. In, when I get back to my hotel room, uh, it would take some time. Not only because producing, I still had to be on the phone and deal with stuff after a 12-hour shoot day, but crazy with all the fake blood and everything. From There's a lot of action in this movie and yeah. all that fighting. It's like this really like syrupy, fake blood sort of substance, and it's sticky, and it would be all over me. And it was like, I mean, good problems to have. It was all, all, all in good fun, of course, but I, would, and I wouldn't trade it for the world. But when you'd like stick your you know chest your 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 chin to your chest your like neck would be so i'd have to needless to say take like an hour and a half shower every night as well on top of it all <laughs> yeah it was it was non-stop man it was crazy yeah. what was it like filming during covid because i know that adds so many different restrictions to film sets i spoke to a director the other day who in the country that he was filming in once his cast and crew set foot on the set, they could not take off from the set at any stage throughout the shoot. So you had people sleeping on set of a night time. What kind of restrictions did you guys have to work with and did that make it tougher to film? Yeah, it was such an obstacle. Like, let me tell you, we have to have different stations on set so you keep people divided, whether it's wardrobe or, of course, craft services and food or, uh, you know, lighting guys, camera guys. So it was, um, we had different stations. And, of course, we had a whole, uh, it, you know, the sad part is, David, it's so hard for independent films, I think, to survive in this because it was such an extra expense. Yeah. Uh, we were in Nevada, Las Vegas, Nevada, for 19 days, and the uh, the entire crew and myself, uh, the actors get a little bit more, but the crew got a lot too. I got 22 COVID tests in 19 days wow. of filming. Yeah, at one point. So like I said, it cost the production so much, and there's a lot of extra time because you have to get these. Uh, we do the tests at the hotel before you arrive to set. So this way to keep, of course, um, uh, obvious uh, safety protocol um, of spreading if anyone did come up positive to, to catch it before they came on set. And it was really tricky. We brought some of our crew from um, when we went to Vegas. We brought as many of the guys and girls as we could from New York, but then we had to get a few locals for um, uh, locations and different places, and one of the days we, we got tested, my phone was zinging at like, you know, six in the morning, there was a pod positive with one of the locations guys. Now, they never made it to set, however, it caused a lot of concern, a lot of stress for me, because your number one concern is always safety, yeah. and uh, 
it was really crazy, man. So we had to, we shut down for a few days yeah. until we tested again. There's like a three day. So it just, I mean, I can go on and on about it, but the, the, the end of the equation is, I mean, the money and the time, I think it's going to be during that impossible for like a million or $2 million budget film. There's a lot of films for 500,000 to live in that yeah. because that's what you're spending on, on COVID. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, look, it's been the same here as well. I think our, our, um, our film industry in our city has been pretty much non-existent for the last two years because we've been in lockdown for 240 days. Like, we're, we're out now, but, um, yeah, it just, you, you can't imagine it. But talking of the crew of the film, um, I'm a huge fan of Bridget Smith. I loved her first film, Snow Babies. Tell us a little bit about what it was like working with Bridget and Samuel as directors. Yeah, so Bridget is just such a, 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 a caring director. She creates such a safe vibe on set. And she allows, you know, acting is, you know, it's about jumping off a cliff. You make choices. You put your two feet on the ground. You listen and you answer. And uh, you want to feel like you're, you're right off the bat communicating well with your director and you're in safe hands and you're able to go there and take those risks and make it, you know, sort of crazy and fun and go on this wild roller coaster ride with your, with your, with your scene partner. And what Bridget did was she really sets the tone with the crew and with her actors to just make it a free, very creative, safe place. And um, so it was wonderful communicating with her about the character, about the script and then about the scene we would be shooting and yeah she's she's really talented and um i think you know bridget's responsible for most of the story um uh, so there's the other character is jed and he's played by mark Menchaca from uh, ozark and um uh, uh the outsider stephen king's the outsider anyway he and i had most of our scenes together and those scenes like there's some pretty heavy dramatic scenes between us and also joseph gatt as well who plays ram katie the bad guy and she's responsible for those heavy acting scenes and creating that atmosphere and working with our actors and then samuel gonzalez comes into the picture and he is like this crazy uh, super hyper stylized director like his shots are so artistic and creative and i really felt um you know we felt as producers like this is what uh we really needed for this and, and he's incredible with the horror elements of the story as well and the way he captures that so they were a really great combo to have together because you'll you'll certainly see uh i think you know what i'm referring to when i talk about the heavy dramatic acting scenes and yeah. I, I, I think you might know what i'm referring to when i talk about those super hyper stylized crazy shots and those horror scenes Definitely. Look, it's, as I said, I absolutely love this film for all of those reasons. The other reason I love this film is because of the music. And I know you're a musician yourself. So how did you go about putting together this amazing soundtrack that this film has? And of course, that amazing track uh, from, the, from The Who featuring Jacoby. Tell us a little bit about how this soundtrack came together. Oh man, when you said the set, the who, yeah, Wolf Totem. Yeah. That track is so killer, man. I got a huge smile on my face when you said it. And I think about all the music. Well, so first of all, um, a guy named Alan Kovac uh, is, is responsible for this. He is the CEO and founder of Better Noise Music. Better Noise Music is a huge rock label and also a management company. They represent over 40 bands, Motley Crue, Five Finger Death Punch, um, Jacoby Shaddix, Papa Roach, and many, many of the cameos that we have throughout the film. So when I found the script and I brought it to Alan, he was 100%, let's go, let's do this. You know, I thought it was a perfect fit for, for rock, metal, horror, you know? And, yeah. and, and, and again, I think the script for that, it sits on the, on the highbrow side of horror, actually. It has story, which I was, I was really attracted to, to circle back to one of your earlier questions. Like, that was another thing, man. It's like, it's got moments for acting and real characters but yet it's got these crazy horror elements so anyway we uh we we decided who we wanted to put in the film from his label and and how in which uh they how they would fit in and 
it was th- it was very important to us not to do this in a to do it in a very non gratuitous manner. Meaning that if you weren't a fan of that band, you would just think that that lead singer or that band member was an actor yep. in the film. And uh, I think we accomplished that. Our number one goal was to be accepted as a movie first. And what we wanted to do was bring film and music and actors and rock stars together in sort of a seamless way. And I think I said it earlier, but those movies like uh, that had incredible soundtracks like uh, The Crow yeah. uh, or, or Breakfast Club or all those fun you know, 80s, 90s movies, that was another thing that I thought the script lent itself to uh, and, 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 and the style of the writing. Um, so because there are many nods to the 80s, one liners, all that fun stuff in the movie. So what we did was I I would speak with each musician before they got to set. I remember when I called Jacoby Shaddix, Papa Roach, he's like, okay, what what is this, man? And I told him the whole story on the phone. And it was funny because he's like, oh, man, I had a show last night. My feet are killing me. He jumped off a wall. I remember this perfectly. Over two years ago, he, like, jumped off a wall and hurt the soles of his feet. So we were talking about that and the script. And now we've gotten so close through this experience. And we put, we've done so much creatively together. It's crazy because he's so good in the movie. Too. Yeah. I think he's fantastic in it. And um, I think all the musicians were. So what we did was we talked about their roles. We talked about who they were, what the other characters were to their character. And, you know, they all came to play, man. They were all phenomenal. Gave a hundred percent, like really balls to the walls, like had done their homework and were ready to go. And I, and I think we got great performances from all of them. You definitely did, Michael. And to, to finish off... Um... How do you feel now that the film is coming out to people around the world and that it's screening here in Melbourne at the biggest genre film festival in Australia? How does that make you feel? And what would you like to say to people out there who are thinking about buying tickets to go along and see it this weekend? Uh, so how I feel, I told you earlier, nothing was more important than to be accepted in the genre because that's what this is all about. And that's the film that I wanted to make you read a script and then you only hope the final product can be what, what you actually read off the page, right? Because it's one thing to have the script, then to make the movie and then another through editing. And so it means so much to be accepted at the festival and to, to me, to Better Noise, to all the musicians in the film. And I would say that you are in for one heck of a wild ride, an incredible soundtrack um, that will really move you. And each song fully supports the, uh, the emotional uh, stage that, 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 that's going on in the scene well, as well with the actors and everything. And it just gets freaking crazy so what i would say is sit back enjoy the movie and allow yourself to take your revenge fantasy on a little walk 